<laughs> and we apologize for the quality of the lesson this morning, the printing quality. We'll get that fixed too. But at least this is working. So, and it's hot in here, Kirk. It is really, really hot. <laughs> Okay, now he'll turn on the ice machine in just a moment. <laughs> and we'll cool off and then um I know. Lori got me a was it a Dollar Tree fan, Lori? Yes. A fan like yours. I love my Dollar Tree fan. I always feel very sophisticated with that. So thank you so much. Listen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And that is the purpose of our class and of our church and of as, as Christians to be a light to the world because our Savior is alive. And he's coming back someday, maybe very soon. And so I would like for you to continue uh, in the scriptures, in your, in your independent study. You understand I said independent study and not homework, right? Yeah. Independent study of Jeremiah 50, and then I hope you're starting to read 51, because the, you read it already. I'm so, tell me, who all read Jeremiah 50 and 50? Give yourselves a hand. Everybody give these people a hand. Because I think what you're going to do is... <laughs> As you read, uh, as we read Revelation chapter 18, we see great similarities. So I hope you're doing that. And Isaiah, okay, here's another one, Isaiah 13. Now these two prophets, Isaiah lived about 700 years before Christ. Jeremiah lived 500 years so many years before Christ. And they both prophesied of the fall of Babylon. And that's what we're studying in Revelation 18. There is an inter there's a, a near interpretation, meaning uh, after, af right after Jeremiah prophesied of the fall of Babylon, Babylon, the city and the nation, the, cap the empire, was defeated by whom? Persia, by Persia, Cyrus the Great, and that was in 539 B.C. What chapter in the book of Daniel teaches us about the fall of Babylon? Two or five? Five. Very good, Kathy. Uh, chapter two is the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter five is the fall of Babylon. Ch Babylon chapter six is the story of Daniel with a, with a lion's den. And that was under, not the, per, not the Babylonian Empire, but under the Persian Empire. So both of these men and Isaiah prophesied of that fall of Babylon to Persia. But there is also a future prophecy in that. And that prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. It, oh, Ziva, come up here. Hurry, 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 because I'm going to lose my train of thought. But this is our Ziva. Say hi to Ziva. Hi, Ziva. Hi, Ziva. Come up here. She's very happy this morning because she's wearing her heels and she's taller than I am. Your heels are bigger than mine. Well. So you can't fight about that. Well, whatever. How, how did that sound? Did that sound good? Whatever. No. <laughs> Sounded too corny for you. Okay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I'm, You're I'm, too nice for that. I know. I'm too old for that, aren't I? I said nice, not okay, old. Okay, precious. <laughs> Okay, Ziva, that's enough of us, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Ziva has a very important announcement, but I want to start it, okay? Ziva is in our youth group, 7th grade, and they had a challenge this past week to do a thousand things. Wow. I mean, what? In one day. In one day? Mm -hmm. Did you do it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us what you, <laughs> tell me, what are some of the things, some of the things the kids did? for a thousand things. Some did a thousand push-ups. Oh, in one day? Yes. 
<coughs> and I could have done that if I'd wanted to. <laughs> yeah, all right. Did they count 1,000? 1,000. <laughs> okay. And s people, well, my friend Marley, those are her grandparents over there. Marley did a thousand stitches of crocheting. <gasps> crochet, all right. Where'd she learn to crochet? Me and her aunt. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. How many of you girls and men can crochet? Oh, that is awesome. Okay, a thousand stitches of crocheting. Okay, anybody else that you remember? Okay. Um, so what'd you do? I beaded a thousand beads and then I made the bracelets and then I have them ready for, and all the money goes to missions. So I'm trying to find oh. buyers for the bracelets. Okay, so boys and girls, <clears throat> get out your money and make an order. They're right. five dollars a bracelet. Five dollars a bracelet. She made me one one time with my name on it. So thank you. All right, thank you, precious. We love you. We're so glad to have you. Give her a hand. Okay, Aaliyah, come here. Hurry, hurry, hurry. This is my little granddaughter, Aaliyah. So give her a hand. She is not taller than I am. No, there you go. Thank you, precious. Okay, anybody else want to come up here and let me compare heights or anything? <laughs> Micah, come here, baby. Here's our Micah. <laughs> our mathematician. Our mathematician, our scientist, and our researcher. Maybe you better stay down there. Come on up here. Here's my boy. Isn't he precious? Okay. I would like to say something to the class. Oh, please say something to the class real loud because it's here's the microphone. Uh, please pray for my great aunt. My great uncle had just gone into hospice. And um, I think the doctor said that he has less than a week left. Mm. Okay. Okay. We will pray. Where's your grandma today? Um, Lavanda's here's not, grandma. I do not know where my grandma is. Okay, we'll pray for her too. <laughs> all right, love you, precious. Love you We're so glad to have all these kids in here, aren't we? Yes. I'm so blessed because they're going to grow up and be missionaries and Bible teachers. Yes. Now then, where was I? I was on something really height. height. Nothing about height. No. All right. So we'll go from there. As you read Isaiah 50 and 51, I mean Jeremiah 50 and 51, and Isaiah 13, read Revelation 18 and find comparisons and similarities. All right. Today we are on Revelation 18. I've already introduced it, so please go back to the last two weeks of YouTube and listen to those lessons because it's a great introduction to Revelation 18. How many of you looked for yourself on the YouTube video from last week? What? Okay, Virginia, thank you, Alice. Alright, every one of you, listen to me. You go watch the video from last week and see if you can find yourself in Bible class, all right? Because if you were here, you will see yourself. And, and where's Chase? Chase, there were great pictures of everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tell Chase thank you. Thank you. He used to be one of our little boys and he grew up. All right, we're doing Revelation 18. And we're going to, if you would, look at your newsletter because at the very bottom, letter B, we did letter A last week. I'll do it for you again sometime. But letter B on your newsletter, it gives you the outline of Revelation 18. And um, so we'll do that in a minute. But we're studying Babylon. And that was also on your lesson last week. So here is... Um, <coughs> Here is Iraq. Here is the capital of Iraq, Baghdad. And coming straight down on that river is the city of ancient Babylon. And you can go there today if you want to. I don't want to, but you may. There's Lavanda. We missed you, Lavanda. Here's Baghdad. And in about 30 some miles, I think, is uh, Babylon, ancient Babylon. The scriptures lead us to believe, and I think it's true, that Babylon will be rebuilt someday. It, it uh, fell to Persia, and then 
a few couple hundred years later Alexander the Great conquered Persia which means it conquered Babylon and it wasn't until about a hundred years or so after Alexander the Great that the city just fell into disrepair. They moved their capitals to other places in that part of the world and it just became covered by the sand. And it wasn't until about 1960, 70 or 80, somewhere in there, when Saddam Hussein began to dig it up. Isn't that interesting? And so the, we think, according to scripture, that it will be rebuilt probably during the uh, Great Tribulation. It will become the world's political and economic capital city of the world. This is the Antichrist capital city. For a while Rome will have been the capital city of the Antichrist religion and then it moved to Jerusalem. How do we know that the Antichrist religious capital moved to Jerusalem? How do we know that? How do we know that it will? Well, yes, the Bible says so. What does the Bible tell us? He places his palace between the seas. Okay, he places his palace between the seas, but he also, the it's the capital the city of, of, of the, his religion. He puts his image in the temple in Jerusalem and requires everyone to worship him. So we're going to see some major cities during the tribulation, Rome for a while, uh, Babylon, and Jerusalem. There'll be major cities. And it's going to be a literal city about 85 miles south of modern day Baghdad in Iraq. Alrighty? So let's go ahead and look at that. Look at your newsletter. Here are here is the um, outline of Revelation 18. So maybe it would be good for you to go into your Bible and what I like to do is just put a little line between the passages so you know this is where the outline changes because John 8 in John, Revelation 18 John heard four voices coming from heaven and these voices proclaim some very important messages. This is the very end of the seven year tribulation. The very end. And so God in his mercy is still telling people what's going to happen. So John saw, heard these messages and then he actually will see the destruction of Babylon. So let's see how it happens. Verses 1 through 3 is the first voice. It is the voice of condemnation and judgment. Because we will see the throne of God. And whenever we see the throne of God, it means judgment. Verses 4 through 8, there is a voice from the throne. Uh, and I think, as I recall, it's Jesus calling. And he's saying, separate yourselves. Come out from Babylon. Separate yourselves from Babylon. And God is still saying that today. It was a voice calling for God's people to separate themselves from Babylon. 9 through 19 are the, vo yeah, it's getting cold in here, are the voices of lament. Give, give Kirk a hand. Tell him thank you. Um, the fall of Babylon, and, and, and so then the voices of lament. We see in letter A that the world governments are going to be lamenting the fall of Babylon. They stand and they watch it. I guess we, they can watch it on TV or something. This beautiful, majestic, powerful, wealthy city has fallen in one hour. And the kings over the world will lament. We'll read about them in a few weeks. Then verses 11 through 16, we hear the lament of the commercial world. All of the traders and the people who make so much money from this wealthy city will be lamenting because a worldwide depression will occur in one hour. 
And then we hear the voice or the lament of the maritime world, the world of trade. Now in John's time, the way trade was happened was through ships. So we hear the, sh the captains of these ships lamenting the fall. We hear the, sea, the, the people working on the ships. The people in trade are all lamenting of this, of this terrible uh, destruction of the city of Babylon. And then verse number 4, verse 20, is the voice of celebration. We hear the lament, and now we hear celebration. Who's going to be celebrating, do you think, at the fall of Babylon? The what, Ken? Did you say, what? Martyrs. The martyrs, absolutely. Voices from heaven, angels, believers in heaven, martyrs, and then all of those people on earth who are believers and are still alive somehow will be celebrating the, vo the lament, I mean celebrating uh, the fall of Babylon. And then finally, verses 21 through 24 is the destruction of Babylon. And it's going to be very interesting. This stone, a huge, huge stone falls from heaven or it's as if it fell from heaven and landed into the sea. So we kind of wonder, what could that be symbolizing? So, um, somebody in the back, perhaps Lyndon, need to turn up the volume on the computer. Because we're going to listen to a reading of Revelation 18. So have your Bibles opened and follow along and see if you can hear these various points of the outline of Revelation 18. Revelation chapter 18 After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Another voice. Come out of her, my people. Separation. So that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her, as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen, I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery kings. with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe! Woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon! In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes any more. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. 
The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea, will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. Nor worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. Whoa, what did you think of that? Now when you go home today, do a YouTube search for this chapter and just listen to the various uh, various renditions of this chapter. This is a powerful one and it's one that is a warning to to unbelievers and it's a comfort to believers. Listen carefully. This is Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it. Why? Because the time is what? Sure. The time is near. The time is near. And the Bible wants us to know that the time is near. The time of, of the end times when Jesus comes again. It's near. And so I want you to look at your lesson now on page 252. It's the voice of judgment of Revelation 18. And listen carefully. As followers of Christ, I have quit saying Christians. Okay? I've quit saying I'm a Christian. Today I say I am a follower of Christ. And it has a power to it that the word Christian because it's just been abused and misused, hasn't it? So let's start practicing using the term we are followers of Christ. And as a follower of Christ I must be aware of the Babylonian system that we're living in in this time. The Babylonian system goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 10 but it's a system of false religion and this is number letter Roman numeral 2 the Babylonian system has been alive and well and powerful since Genesis 10 and it is a system of a false religion and we see false religion everywhere it's a system of godless commercialism and we're going to learn today that commercialism capitalism monetarism money is not evil but it is what Satan has done with commercialism which has taken God out of it that becomes so wicked so 
godless commercialism. And the system also includes tyrannical governments. So let's think about this and look at our world today. Do we have false religions everywhere? Do we have godless commercialism? Yes. Do we have tyrannical governments? Yes. And this is the Babylonian system that has been going on since Genesis chapter 10 and it's going to become more and more powerful as time goes on. This system has been with us since history began. So Paul and John give us warnings about what we are to look for as this system becomes stronger and stronger. And we're going to read this because it's such a good foundation for studying Revelation 18. So let's look up here at what Paul the Apostle and the Apostle John tell us. And we're going to find it in the first one in 2 Timothy. Now Timothy uh, was a good friend to Paul. He was a young Greek man whose mother and his grandmother were great Christians, great followers of, of Jesus, and they taught him about Timothy and about God. And so he became, in, under Paul, a pastor of some of the new churches. And I'm going to study him more someday and see if I can find where he actually lived, where his churches were. But Paul tells Timothy, be careful, Timothy, take heed as you lead your church. And he said, because he's going to tell us the people that are attracted to the Babylonian system. Which kind of people do you think are attracted to uh, false religion? godless commercialism and tyrannical governments. What kind of people? Godless people. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Lovers of all kinds of things that are not of God. Let's see what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Be sure and study this. This is very important. Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, mark this. Now what does it mean to mark something? If I say mark this, pay attention. Pay really close attention to what I have to say. Mark this, Timothy. There will be terrible times in the last days. You know what? Just read this with me up here and then we'll fill in the blanks. Because I want you to just to hear this. Okay? Mark this, Timothy. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. What's that mean? Well, we know what that means. I put myself first before any and everybody. They will be lovers of money. Everything I do will be to get more money. Boastful. Proudful. Uh, proud. Abusive disobedient to their parents. If we've ever, ever seen that happen, you know when I was a kid they always used this, that kids were so disobedient so it must be a sign of the times. Well I think today we're even closer to that. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful. Oh! Unholy. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of the good treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, we will just think about that in our lives and we pray that we will not in any way begin to, to show that kind of behavior in our lives. We want the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, because there's no law against any of those, is there? So fill that in, and I'll, fill, I'll read it to you again as you fill in your blanks. Be, pay attention, Timothy. There will be terrible times when... In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without what? Without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not what? Not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than what? 
Now that's what Timothy said to, uh, Paul said to Timothy, and that's letter A number one. Let's see what else he said. He wrote a, another letter to Timothy, a young pastor, as he's leading his church, and he says to him here in chapter 6, verse 10, he's going to tell him, let me ask you this, he's going to still be talking about money. Is money the root of all evil. I heard that on the radio. Honestly, I heard that on the radio. I see some people saying no. Is money the root of evil? No. What? Oh, raise your hand if you got that. The love of money. I saw lots of hands. The love of money is the root of all evil. Root of all kinds of evil. Maybe that needs to be turned down a little bit. I don't know. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Evil. Some people, according to Paul, who are eager for money, that is because of their love and their passion for money, let's see what happens. They have wandered from the faith. How is it that people who love money could wander from the faith? Can't serve two gods. Can't serve two gods. Who said that? Jesus did. On the Sermon on the Mount. He said you can't He said you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve money and God. So if your whole effort in life is to have money, then then you are a lover of money and it will cause you to wander from the faith and look what happens when you wander from the faith. You will pierce yourself with many griefs. We see that all the time, don't we? People who wander from the faith in their jobs, they're looking for more money at the expense of their families, their marriages, their children, their relationships, their work at church, all of that goes away and it pierces them because when you lose your family because of wandering around it grieves you doesn't it so this is what Paul is telling Timothy to tell his people now John in uh, 1st John chapter 2 the, there are a 1st 2nd and 3rd John who is that John that wrote these letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? Uh, what? The apostle. The who said that? Thank you, Lyndon, the apostle. Who was his brother? James. Who was his father? Zebedee. Zebedee, that's right. And his mother, his, I don't know that we know his mother's name, but his mother was the one who loved her boys so much, James and John. And she went to Jesus and she said, Hey, when you set up your kingdom, can you put James on this side and John on this side, right close to the throne? I want him as close to the throne as possible. And Jesus kind of laughed at that. Um, but that was James and John. What books did John write other than the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John Revelation. and the book of Revelation. A very, very godly man. He was the only disciple of Jesus who did not die a martyr's death. But he was very much persecuted for his following of Jesus. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2 that worldly things never last. In fact, what Jesus said, don't lay up your treasures on earth because moths will eat it rust will corrupt it so he said don't lay your tre don't don't focus on putting your treasures on earth all that money what where do you lay up your treasures in heaven, in heaven. and that's what uh, Jesus told us so John tells us that thing worldly things never last look what he said don't love the world do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, as we look at Babylon, and as you heard chapter 18, those people loved the world, didn't they? They were so, so horrified at the destruction of this beautiful city of Babylon because they loved the world, and they loved everything in the world. He said, if you love the world, 
be careful here. Here's the warning. If anyone loves the world, then love for the Father is not in them. Alright? He said, everything, everything in the world, and this when he's talking about the world, he's not talking about the earth, the beautiful earth. He's not talking about people because Jesus said for God so loved the world so God loves the world meaning people what is John talking about when he says don't love the world and if you love the world the love of the Father is not in you what does that mean? Yes, Ziva. It means that they, they love that and they want that more than they would spend time with God and work on the relationship Exactly it means all of the things of the world that don't include God. Exactly. Give her a hand. I love my kids. And so Ziva, John is saying don't, to love the world more than we love God, right? It's that world system. And here is what it is. John tells us. It's the lust of the flesh. So that's anything that's from inside you that controls you. Anything that's an appetite. Too much food. Too much ice cream, all right? Don't let that control you. Sex, appetite food and sex are good things, but Satan has done what to them? Perverted them. Perverted them. So don't let that become a lust of the flesh. Drugs and pleasures, anything that gives you pleasure that is not of God is a lust of the flesh. Kathy? I mean, it's also like leaders in, and I'm, I'm sorry to say government, but leaders in government, leaders in business, how they will do corruptive things to gain a position. Lie, deceit, steal, because they want the power or the money so bad. And you know what that's called? The lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Right here. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh is something of your body that you want. The lust of the eyes are the things that you see that you want. Possessions. Power, authority. What do I have up here? Possessions. Yeah. All right. Then he says, the third thing that's part of the world system is the pride of life. That's proud. Being proud. Being wanting um, uh, power and wealth and superiority. Remember Hitler? He had the pride of life. Meaning because he said his race was superior to any other race. That's ungodly, isn't it? Yes. And so these are the things that John says that we need to be careful that we don't love. Those things don't come from God. Where do they come from? The world. The world. They come from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But what happens? Whoever does the will of God does what? lives forever. Aren't these beautiful verses? We really need to take them to heart. Study these verses because if there is anything that we're doing or that we want or that we see that doesn't include God, it's not from the Father. It's from the world. Listen, letter A, the love of pleasures. That's the flesh. Anything that you love more than lo you love God. The love of pleasures, the flesh, and of possessions, that's the eyes. And pride is but an insidious form of what? Idolatry. idolatry. And what did God say in Exodus 20 about idolatry? Doesn't like it. <laughs> Doesn't like it. Thou shalt put nothing before God. All right. Uh, letter B, it is demonic in its origin. These, lo these, these things, these things of the world are from Satan. They originate from Satan. And finally, it will destroy you. Jesus said in John 10.10, this is one of my life verses, John 10.10. Jesus said Satan came to do three things. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Anything that steals from you, kills a relationship, or destroys whatever is important is from Satan. But Jesus said, but I came that you might what? Have life. Have life. And have life more 
than abundantly. We are to have an abundant life. So that's letter uh, A number three. Anybody have questions on any of that? All right. Now the reason that I'm doing this is because when we look at Babylon, we're seeing everything of the world. We're seeing all of those attributes that are so wicked. We're seeing the love of pleasure, the love of, of des your desires and, and your passions, and it's destructive and power. So we're going to look at that real carefully now. Okay. We've seen, oh, got to do something else <laughs> before I get to Revelation 18. Can't ever get there, but I'm going to get there today. As we studied Revelation, we looked at Revelation chapter 14. And I hope you remember it because it's three angels and they're like satellites and they're flying about the earth and everybody can see these angels. Everybody in the whole world can see and hear these angels. They're flying around the earth with messages. Now how would they see these angels and hear these angels flying about the earth? TV, that's right, from satellites. So if you want to, just go over there. There is an angel proclaiming the gospel. This is what it says. I saw another angel flying in midair. Isn't that fun? Can you just see this? He sees an angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. What's the eternal gospel? Good the good news for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life can you imagine an angel flying about the earth proclaiming that but that's what he was doing it was to every nation every tribe language and people and here's his message he said in a loud voice fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. You know what? This is God's mercy in the book of Revelation. For Christians, this is a wonderful book. But he shows his mercy all the time. An angel is flying about the earth saying, the time of judgment has come. It's a mercy, that's warning, isn't it? He said, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water. And that's letter B, number one. A proclamation of the angel. He had what? The eternal gospel. Now there's a second angel in chapter 14. And this is letter B, number two. The second angel. And he proclaims the first warning of the imminent fall of Babylon. Babylon is powerful. It's wealthy. That's where the Antichrist lives and when he's not in Jerusalem. And it's making the whole world rich except for the people who are slaves, which is most. He's warning of the intimate fall of Babylon. Look what he says. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. What? is adulteries. It's a metaphor for what? Idolatry. She, they call it adulteries, but it's idolatry. And that's number two. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great because of her idolatry. And with idolatry comes all that wickedness. And then in chapter uh, 14, verses 9 through 12, there's another angel flying about the air. And he's warning of the consequences of taking the mark of the beast. In the book of Revelation, who is the beast? The Antichrist. And the prophet says everybody has to take a mark on their hand or on their forehead, a mark of the beast. Do we know what the mark is? Six, six, six. Okay, but we don't really know what that means, do we? But it's a mark of the Antichrist, the beast. Let's see what this angel is saying. So let me tell you. In that time, people are not going to be taking the mark of the Antichrist accidentally, are they? No. No, because they're being warned, don't take it. Let's see what he says. 
a third angel followed the other two angels and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, who's the beast? The Antichrist. And its image, where's its image? In the temple. And receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand. He said, if you do, you, they too, will drink the wine of God's fury. You take the mark and you will not ever be redeemed from that. You will, they will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. This is God's anger for, the reject, for his rejection. Look at the next verse. Those who take the mark, God's fury, will feel the full strength of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur. In the King James Version, you and I heard this as brimstone. Fire and brimstone. They will be tormented with burning sulfur or brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And the smoke of their torment will rise for how long? Forever and ever. Ever, ever. Remember when we were growing up and we got so scared because our preachers preached on hell and brimstone. Yeah. Hell, fire, and brimstone, right? Yeah. Do you think perhaps maybe we ought to hear a little more of that in our churches today? Yeah. I think we do because this is in the scriptures and it is warning people. <coughs> Don't do these things. Don't follow the world system. Because this is what happens. We need to be warning our loved ones and our friends. There will be no rest. This is still the prophecy in chapter 14. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. And that's number three. Any questions on this? Because the reason I told you that is because chapter 18 introduces us to even another angel. Okay? These angels are mighty. They are powerful. And they are giving a message around the world to accept the eternal gospel. To know that the fall of Babylon is coming. And do not take the mark of the beast. These are the things. Now let's look at the fourth angel. Another angel. Revelation 18. We have another angel. And this angel is flying about as well. And this is what chapter... This is the first three verses of chapter 18. Alright, I'm going to get through with it today because next week we're going to do verses 4 through 6. John says, after I saw all this... Now we're going to remember, I told you last week. He said, after this... After, whenever you see that, you say, you say to yourself, what do you, what do you say to yourself? After what? After what? After what? Well, after this is chapters 16 and 17. The seven bold judgments and the fall of the religious system of Babylon. So go back into the books, into the videos, and you'll find this. John said, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. This angel had great authority. So we see that when this word means he had more authority than the other angels who were flying around. He was probably their superior because he had great authority. Didn't say that about the other angels, did it? And let's look at what else. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. What would you see there? What are you seeing when you read that? The earth was illuminated by him. It was very bright, wasn't it? The whole earth was illuminated by his splendor. God has a mighty creation that you and I can't even imagine. And so here we see this angel flying and he had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. And with a mighty voice he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So here it is again. He's warning them. Babylon is going to fall. She has become, now look at how wicked Babylon is. We've read about it, but let's look. She has become a dwelling for demons. This is a haunted city. 
You walk into that city, you will feel the wickedness of demonology, of Satan. Uh, she has become, is, is this happened yet? Has this happened yet? No, but it's going to. She will become a dwelling for demons. She will become a haunt for every impure spirit. A haunt for, I'm going to, we'll fill it out in a minute. A haunt for every unclean bird. Now whenever the scriptures talk about birds in this respect, Jesus talked about birds. It's always in a, in a tone or to rep, represent de demonology. When Jesus talks about the birds, it's demons, devils, demonology. So it's a haunt for every clean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. What does adulteries mean? Adultery. Okay. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. And, yeah, okay. So you can see three things there. The nations... The kings and the merchants have all become conquered or enslaved by these possessions of this wicked, wicked, haunted city. Now let's quickly look through this, all right? Verse 1. When is this proclamation given? John says, after this. So what, when is after this? It's after the events of chapters 16 and 17. And that is, um, where are we? Okay, letter C, number one, after this, this proclamation comes after chapter 16, which is the seven bold judgments. So go back and read that, okay? They're horrifying, the things that will happen. And then finally, number two, it's also after the destruction of religious Babylon. Who destroyed religious, the religious system of the Antichrist? The kings of the earth did. They hated it. So that's chapter 17. So after all of that happened, Mary. Another kind of proclamation of what? On the what is that? Judgment. Okay. okay. Now let's look at that. Okay. After the events of chapter 16 and 17. Chapter 16, number letter A is the seven bold judgments. Be sure and read that. Chapter 17 is after the judgment and destruction of the false religion of Babylon. And I have all of this on YouTube. So just go back a few weeks and you can hear this. Now, uh, let number two. Who is giving this proclamation? Do you remember? Another angel. Another angel. Another angel. Coming down from where? Heaven. Heaven. He had great what? Authority. Authority. And the earth was illuminated by his what? Splendor. Splendor. I can just, no, I can't imagine that, but it must be great. This angel is powerful and glorious. This is, um, I'm sorry about that, number two. He will be given, it, the message will be given by a powerful and glorious angel. He is a, apparently an angel of superior rank to the angels of chapter 14. How do I say that? Because it declares that he is, has great what? Authority. Authority. And then letter C, as he flies about the earth like a what? Okay, that's not in the scriptures, is it? Is that in the scriptures? No. Okay. Uh, but I would think it would be like that. He will bring an important message. The doom of what? Babylon. Babylon is doomed. The whole earth will see this angel. The whole earth is going to hear his message. Do you want to be here? Would you like to see that? No, I don't think we do. Because we would be in a very, very bad straits if we did. We can see it from heaven. That's letter C, number two. Any questions on that? Not going too fast, am I? Yeah. No. You kind of are. <laughs> really Hold on. Especially for our first time. We don't know.
I know. Are we writing just, notes? Are we okay, you just hold on. Don't don't not come back. Oh, we'll be back. Because you'll figure it out. And I'll help you. We're doing this last part of I didn't get to my second page, did I? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Who this is another book in the Old Testament. How many of you ever heard of Habakkuk? It's a minor prophet, not meaning he's not important, just a very short book. Yeah. I have a friend, and I know I've told many of you this story before, but I have a friend who was a new Christian, and he was going to church, and the pastor was preaching. I'm giving you time now, Dar is it Darla? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm giving you time now to fill all this in. Um, I'll go back. There, how's that? Anyway, they were teaching about, the, he was teaching the minor prophets, and he was telling me about, this man was telling me about this minor prophet they'd studied and he couldn't remember, could not remember the um, title of that prophet. And he said, but it was something like tobacco. Something like tobacco. <laughs> and that's Habakkuk. Okay. So that's how you remember that. Uh, this angel, this angel in chapter 18, and his proclamation are the fulfillment of a, pro of a prophecy that tobacco, I mean Habakkuk, gates. <laughs> and here it is. This is beautiful. Here's the prophecy of Habakkuk. Uh, the earth, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? In, in this time, in this great horrific time of tribulation, the world is going to be filled with the glory of the knowledge of God. He is not going to leave his people. What are y'all doing? Closing up shop. All right. Do waters cover the sea? Waters cover the sea, don't they? That's how beautiful the earth will be with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. It's like the waters that cover the sea. <laughs> I guess I know when I'm through. <laughs> I knew I was through. Now then, we did not get... <laughs> oh my goodness. We did get to verse 1. <laughs> Let me look up here at me just for a minute. I've got two minutes. Everybody, eyes up here. Um, I take so long in getting through these lessons. Do you want me to... See, you know what I like to do? I like to go into the Old Testament and show you stuff. I like to go into the New Testament, into the Gospels, and into the Epistles to show you how this all fits. But I can't get done very quickly. So, what I need you to do is to come talk to me and tell me whether you want me to slow down or, go f or not do so much of this stuff. Well, I no. <laughs> I didn't want that. Well, of course I do. But here's the thing. If I hadn't read Timothy to you today about what Jesus, of what Paul was telling this young pastor about what to look for, I think I would be negligent. But but the thing is, uh, we did one verse and out of Revelation today. Well, maybe two. Revelation one verse three. Yes, pa uh, yes, dot. But you're giving us meat. Not is the, the meat. Okay, here's what Dorothy said, and this is what I wanted to hear Dorothy say it again really loud. You're giving us the meat, not the meal. Okay. Oh, here's, to, oh, now this is what I want. <laughs> Terry. Catherine, you know I've told you this many, many times. As I've been my years of going to church, I always was told, don't worry about the Old Testament. Just worry about the New Testament, because it all has to do with the gospel of Jesus. You, I've told this to you many, many times. You have opened that. Have opened the Old Testament to you? Be comprehensive to the New. That's really good. I want you to come together. And the Gospels. I mean, yeah. Jesus is teaching Cheryl. This is fun. I want you to keep teaching like you teach when you was in school to where we learned it. Hearing it one time, it just goes out. Right. And so, Darla, you'll hear it again. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lavonda over here. Well, the New Testament and uh, Old Testament is 
like a basket and it weaves together. Yes. And you can't have yes. one without yes. the other. Yeah. Thank you. That is so true. So Darla? Darla is brand new today. Say hi, Darla. Her mom, her mama Rose, and her aunt. I'm Don. I'm my cousin. Cousin Don. And you were looking for Aunt Rose. Okay. Okay, Darla. I just wanted to say, just being our first time, I think that you're doing a wonderful job. I really love it. I love your style of teaching. Um, okay, you know I don't. You know I love that hearing that, but I just want to know if I if I'm not going to. So, uh, Lyndon, my darling husband. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what. <laughs> You know, it takes me weeks to prepare these lessons, really, and I work so hard on them for hours and hours and weeks and weeks, and by the time I'm ready to present it, I think, oh my gosh, they're going to be so tired of this. But then I remember, <laughs> I hadn't taught it yet, so. Um, I, I love this class, and I just thank God for you. Thank you for letting me be your teacher. Let's pray because there are people hanging out out there. But they told me I had until 5 till 11. That's what they told me. I won't do that to you though. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are like a basket. They're weaved together and we can't know one without the other. Thank you that someday the knowledge of your glory will fill the whole earth. What a blessing. What a promise that is. And what a comfort that will be to the believers who are in living through the tribulation. We pray for them today, Lord. We pray that they will stay strong that they will not deny you, that they will not take the that they will just stick with you even unto death. And Father, I pray for the people in this room. You've brought them here for a very special purpose. And Lord, we just pray for each one of them. They'll open their Bibles today and read. That they will examine their hearts to make sure that we are not reflecting in any way the Babylonian system or the systems of this godless world. But we will have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and meekness and patience and service. Because against these things, there is no law. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. And it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you for letting me be your teacher. <laughs>